Okay, hello, good morning everybody and welcome to the Kimmel Bay Church Monday morning vlog. My name is Connor and this morning we will be looking at 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 11 to 16, which I will read for you now. So the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. For my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So in these verses, blessings are promised to the family and posterity of David. These promises relate to Solomon, David's immediate successor, and the royal line of Judah. But they also relate to Christ, who is often called David and the son of David. To him, God gave all power in heaven and earth, with the authority to execute judgment. He was to build the gospel temple, a house for God's name, the spiritual temple of true believers, to be a habitation of God through the Spirit. The establishing of his house, his throne and his kingdom forever can be applied to no other than to Christ and his kingdom. David's house and kingdom long since came to an end. The committing iniquity cannot be applied to the Messiah himself, but to his spiritual seed. True believers have infirmities for which they must expect to be corrected, though they are not cast off. Israel's struggle to take the land and the destructive spiral of the period of the judges paved the way for the monarchy. Thus begins the shift from tribal society to a more central government, where the focus of attention moves from the nation to the king. With kingship comes the ambivalence of the political order and human rule that we know so well. It's necessity alongside its tendency to corruption. The writers of the biblical records do not hide the negative details of Israel's kingship, the person of David included. But with the kingship comes a further reminder of God's gracious willingness to get his fingers dirty with politics, society and culture. His determination to work through human foibles and failures, his ultimate oversight of the covenant relationship with his people is played out and preserved in the history and politics of real life. At this point in the story, David has been crowned king. He has defeated Israel's enemies and has moved the Ark of the Covenant to the newly secured capital city, which is Jerusalem. Concerned that his own royal palace is more lavish than God's dwelling, David is determined to build a temple for God. As it turns out though, he is not allowed to build a house or a temple, if you like, for God, and instead is told that God will build a house or dynasty for him, giving him the promise of a kingdom that will last forever, in which true kingship will be marked by faithfulness to God. God's covenant with David adds a new dimension to the biblical story. Now we have a royal representative of the people, God's son, no less, with the promise of the covenant, covenant focused on Mount Zion, the place where God will be seen to dwell with his people as their true king. This language is echoed in many of the Psalms, where the king's reign is celebrated as marked by wisdom and righteousness, providing a visible centre of God's rule for the sake of the nations. As you might expect, 
then God's commitment to David has implications beyond Israel and stands in continuity with the promise to Abraham of blessings to all nations itself tied to God's purpose for creation. David and his sons will take centre stage in the story of God's dealings with men and women. So through his line, through his anointed son, the Lord may restore and bless the whole world. So far, we have seen a pattern in the biblical story where there is a move from particular to the universal. The Lord singles out one person, Abraham, for the blessing of the nations and one nation, Israel, to be a light to the world. And now he singles out one king, David, and one place, Zion, for the sake of the extension of his rule to the ends of the world. In what ways then is it possible to see Christians singled out in order to bless others? It's an extremely thought-provoking question, um, which brings an end to this study. And the guide that we're given goes on to ask, has there been an example in your life? Which of course made me think. And there's one thing that, that came to, to mind that I'll just quickly share with you. Um, in my current job role, I work with a team of lads that are all non-believers. They're all well aware of my beliefs and at times they will try and engage me with the stereotypical lads banter. I always avoid being drawn into such conversations, but it does not stop them from trying. At times I can definitely feel singled out. However, when we stay away, we share rooms and I've had the opportunities to have in-depth discussions about Christ with many of them, often sharing my story and how he has blessed me and continues to do so. There's one young lad especially, um, Nathan, he took like a duck to water with the, uh, with the UCB Word of the Day devotionals that I listen to most mornings. Um, and now he routinely listens to them at home. And when we're traveling in the car, he will shush the lads so he can play it on his phone for us all to listen to. I have since passed a, a Bible onto him and have seen him reading it um, in the night time when we've got our own time and um, he informs me that he does read it at home as well. So if we can all pray for my young friend Nathan, who I believe has the Holy Spirit at work in him. So I'd love to hear your stories as well, if you could share them with me when we sit, meet at church on Sunday. I pray you all have a blessed, beautiful week in Christ.